Graham Pohl, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you, Stephen. Strikes me that when you left top flight, top flight refereeing, you had become jaded and cynical. Is that fair? Um, I think disillusion would be um, would probably more accurate, a more accurate feeling. Um, it's difficult to, to, to be on top of your game ongoing. I mean, a lot of people talk about, oh, we need to make referees get their young, um, to give them a chance to dominate and become world uh, players as opposed to just domestic players that you know people don't realize there's a there's a real pecking order in refereeing and and I made the the international list at 31 uh, the, the top elite group at 33 and, and and I did 10 years in that uh, 11 years in that and, and and that's difficult to maintain the standard that you're doing you think about a player who reaches the pinnacle of his career how many years does he actually perform at that very top level and I think I'd, I'd done my time but I used those words advisedly, jaded and cynical, because uh -huh. you describe how toward the end of your career, you had begun to think that there was no point in certain decisions being taken because mm -hmm. you wouldn't be backed by the footballing authorities. Mm -hmm. You'd lost confidence in the system. Yes, I had. Um, and, and it wasn't just me. You know, we had the discussions around, around the referees at our training camps and get-togethers and, and issues such as managers their behaviour within the technical area, how they got away with what they called the, the circus that surrounds football, we disagreed with. But when, when a manager gets reported three times within a six-month period and the, the, the total of his fines is £3,000, you wonder why bother reporting him. If that's all he's going to get, which effectively for him, he might just go, well, do you want cash? It, it, it's not effective. So why do you think the football authorities, the FA, were not backing you? That's, that's a real difficult question to answer. I mean, I, I asked. I mean, uh, obviously, obviously when, I, when I left, I was quite outspoken about I was disappointed and disillusioned with that, that lack of support. Um, the, the situation, they came back and said, well, you should have told us. And I said, well, I did. In November, when I had the big John Terry case, I did say to you I was disappointed. I did feel you left me hanging to dry. I did feel you left my integrity in question. And that is the key thing for a referee. Who, who did you tell that to? The very top people I at spoke the FA, to Brian, Brian Barwick? I, I spoke to Brian Barwick himself. I spoke to Graham Noakes, who's the company secretary. And I spoke to the people in charge of the um, compliance unit. And what the did they say to you? Oh, be patient, Graham. These things take time. There's a process we have to go through. We have to investigate all things. We're not just representing referees. We represent players. So, you know, if a player's made an accusation against a referee, we don't just investigate the player, we investigate all parties. But within two or three days, they had categoric assurances from my two assistants and my fourth official that what I'd been accused of saying I hadn't said, because we were all mic'd up, they heard every word I said during that match, and we had video evidence to prove that what John Terry said I'd said to him on the field couldn't possibly have happened because there were no words exchanged between us. Well, so I want to talk about the Terry incident particularly mm -hmm. uh, in some detail in a moment because okay. he's the England captain. It does right. matter. But before we get to that, I just want to continue with this general theme mm -hmm. that you quit the business, that you quit the game, mm -hmm. thinking that the FA was not backing referees. Is it because they were in the end, too heavily influenced by the power of players and managers? I don't know. It, it, it's, it's something, you know, without getting inside the FA and, and understanding, I mean, the, the various committees that they work, work within, it, it's difficult to know. Um, I always had the feeling that I wasn't an FA-type man. Uh, well, this isn't just about you, it's about referees. It's, it's, it's about the authority of referees. But, but, but what you've got in the end was it, it almost became a battle between the, the country's lead referee... And, and the country's lead player, if that's what the England captain is. And that, that's something we could discuss. And I felt that, in the end, OK, they said, oh, well, we found him guilty, or he ended up pleading guilty, and they fined him £10,000. Now, £10,000 to me is a huge amount of money. £10,000 to John Terry is a morning's wages. Uh, that's not really teaching him a lesson, in my view. And, uh, and until and unless the authorities come down heavier and are more appropriate with players and managers, they're not going to improve their behaviour. Well, I want to pick up that point too later on, but just sticking with what you said about oh, a decade and a half at mm -hmm. the top of the game in the Premier League, international refereeing as well, you've talked about the pressure, yep. about how it takes its toll on you. Is the pressure much greater today than it was when you started out in the professional oh, oh, game? Without a doubt. I mean, you, you, you almost can't compare the two things. It's almost impossible. Over just 14 years, you can't compare how it was to how it is. And if you had to define as briefly as you can why the pressure is so much greater, what is that definition? <laughs> that, 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 I would take that away from the FA and say that's, that's media scrutiny. That, that's more than, more than anything else. It's media scrutiny in that it used to be six cameras a, 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 a game. It used to be that um, a referee could be called incompetent. 
but he, he was never questioned his integrity. Now it's a personal attack. It's, it's, you know, a referee takes great delight in sending a player off. It's about how he wants to be sent to stage. It's, it's a personal attack, and also there's undermining the integrity. You only gave a penalty because it's a big team. And there becomes, there's become this real fascination with big team, little team, that maybe was always there, but was never to the fore. And a referee's integrity was never questioned. Now maybe that's because in other countries, Virtually, you know, almost every other country in Europe, when you, when you look, there's been Italy, Germany, Portugal, Greece, Poland, there's been problems with corruption in refereeing. Maybe that's starting to, because we've got lots of um, international players coming across, maybe people are thinking that that happens here. And is it because it's moved on to the issue of basic referees' integrity rather than just incompetence and mm -hmm. making rubbish decisions? Yep. Is that the reason why, and just to quote Urs Meyer, who, mm -hmm. a colleague of yours, top yep. international referee, yep. who's always now connected with the Euro 2004 yes. game, Portugal-England, when he disallowed an English goal, which English fans thought he should have given, allowed, uh -huh. he has now said that he believes, because of the sorts of accusations levelled at referees about their integrity, mm -hmm. that a referee will be killed within the next five years. It's, it's, it's an interesting... I mean, I, I wouldn't go as far as that. I hope, certainly hope they aren't. I mean, uh, it, well, obviously we all hope they won't it, it, be, it, but uh, have you ever felt threatened? I've felt threatened. I've been threatened. You know, I've, I've received death threats. I've received dreadful things in the post. Death I've threats? Received, yeah. Death I've, threats from whom? I received death threats from, from fans after a particular game went against them. And that was, I mean, that's, I've, I've put that in the book I've, I've just, just released, as you know. Um, and that, that's something which you look at and think, you know, they went to the trouble of going abroad to post that to me. It wasn't posted in North London, it was posted in Spain. So it was kind of, well, you're not going to trace us and here we are. You know, on the phone, regularly, I'm going to have to change my mobile number a number of times because people get your number and threaten you. Or they'll phone your home when you're out and they know you're out because you're doing a game on television. And, and say to your wife what they're going to do to you. What on earth does that do to your family? It, uh, it makes it very difficult for them. I mean, one thing you have to assure them is the people that do these things, if someone wants to hurt someone, they hurt them. That's, that's always my view on it. If they don't, if they want to scare them, then they threaten them. And that's the only way you can deal with that, that type of thing. It's not pleasant, and that's part of the life of a referee. So let's bring it back, back to the way the game has changed. You've already raised John Terry. Mm -hmm. And you've already talked about the way in which integrity of referees is questioned yep. and your integrity has been questioned in ways that it wasn't before. Mm -hmm. So let's bring it down to the specific and what happened with John Terry. It was a Chelsea Tottenham game, wasn't it? Yeah, Nove and November the 5th, uh, 2006. Um, it was, it was uh, a Sunday afternoon game, fireworks night, as, uh, as, as it was billed, and will, uh, will the rockets go off? And they did. Um, the, the, th the thing that's never been explored fully is, is the game was refereed properly. The game was refereed well. There weren't mistakes in the game. John Terry, you could look at the send-off, the second course, and say maybe it was harsh. I would say it was correct. I'm biased, obviously. But I've looked at it back, and it's not wrong. But, but, but Graham Paul, to those who were not at the game and don't remember the game, in essence, what happened was that you sent the current England captain, yep. John Terry, off. Yep. He claimed that you had given him reasons for that sending off while on the pitch, yep. which you then later changed and came up with a whole other set of reasons That's... because later on you felt that would sound better. Yes. And yeah. when we're talking questioning of integrity, John Terry made you sound like a liar. That's, that's exactly how I felt, yes. And, that's, and, and because but with video evidence, I mean, I, I mean, TV company produced a video which had me and John Terry on film permanently, uninterrupted, throughout, from the moment he committed the offence to the moment he left the field of play. And it was impossible for me to have spoken to him. So it proved categorically that I was not a liar and that, that he was. The issue is, did he believe, because what people don't realise is the stress that's out there on the field of play makes you think things have happened that haven't. I've given penalties and when I've seen a video replay back, I'm looking at that situation going, well that isn't what I saw. And that's a really uncanny thing. It's really difficult to deal with that and think, well that's the actuality of what I saw. So maybe John Terry thought I'd said something to him and then when I explain it to him afterwards. The, disappo the disappointment... Did thing, he ever get back to you and say, I'm sorry, because you felt that's, that's you've been vindicated to. by the video evidence? That, that's the disappointing thing, is, is when a player at the end of the day, he, he then says, he's wrong. OK, I was wrong, or he didn't even say he was wrong, he just accepted the charge and paid the £10,000 fine. Uh, some people suggested afterwards that was something which was done. Bear in mind that it's the FA, the England captain, and, and as long as it was a pleaded guilty, it's a £10,000 fine. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, but look, this is the question. Following, following that, I would hope, knowing, I've, I've known John Terry for years, I saw him break into the Chelsea first team. I got on brilliant with JT, as I always used to call him. I got, I got told off by a manager, a rival manager, the, the same season, 
for calling him JT on the pitch. He said, you're over familiar with him, you're too friendly with John Terry. And then John Terry turns on you and now there's no contact. I mean, I'm, I'm is, not expecting... Hang on, I want to ask you this, plain and simple. Is John Terry, given your experience of him, fit to be England's captain? I think he has all the attributes to be an England captain. That's not what I asked you. I know it isn't and I'm going to tell you the answer. I, have, I think he has all the attributes to be an England captain. I hope he learns his lesson, but at this moment in time, no, I don't believe he should be an England captain. Not fit to be England captain. Give, give, given the way he challenges referees, what, watch, watch Chelsea's games going forward. Well, I've just watched the Chelsea game. Last week I watched Chelsea-Liverpool. Okay. I watched John Terry in the lead, in the vanguard of yep. Chelsea's efforts to make their case to the referee in very mm -hmm. loud and no uncertain terms. Uh -huh. Do you believe between Jose Mourinho and John Terry, the captain, that Chelsea, to take one of Britain's mm -hmm. leading teams right now, yep. have a deliberate policy of bullying and intimidating referees? I find it hard not to when you watch John Terry play for England and he doesn't go to those excesses that he goes to when playing for Chelsea. So if it's in someone's intrinsic nature, that's how they behave and they can't control themselves. Like, like Cantona when he was in his full pomp. You couldn't talk to him about don't do this or don't do that, that was him. Wayne Rooney now, he goes in, you know, he's got problems with metatarsals. He won't stop challenging like he challenges, it's part of Wayne's game. John Terry challenges a referee in a domestic game when playing for Chelsea. Will challenge a referee when playing for Chelsea on a UEFA match, and yet when playing for England, he behaves very, very well. So, deliberate intimidation. I, I can't see how it isn't. Do you think it's helpful when you deal with Chelsea and it's Mourinho and Terry that you particularly single out mm -hmm. as being a problem in your career. Yep. When you respond by saying, and I'm quoting direct from a piece you wrote in the newspaper recently, that Jose Mourinho, the manager, mm -hmm. sinks lower than his dog's belly in his dealing with referees. You're, you're trying to make a case for players yep. and managers being held to account for what yep. you regard as their outrageous bullying behaviour. Yes. And then you come up with a quote like that. It was, it was a, well, you've got to keep that in context. It was at the time when his dog was, uh, was wanted by immigration. I doubt Mr Mourinho is going to make you many allowances. I don't, think, it, I, I don't think he is. And uh, if, if, if I, I wouldn't tell you, because I've never told anyone what he said to me at the, at the last game of last season, the Chelsea Man United League game, and I would say well, the I, to be honest with you, I think you have to tell me because the comment, no, because I don't. The, well, the, the comment he passed. If you want would the public to understand that. and you want the FA to understand, you've already made the point on this program of saying the FA have not backed me, and they have allowed mm -hmm. to a certain extent this situation with managers and players bullying referees to get out of hand. Mm -hmm. Well, you are going to have to tell the public, me, the FA, mm -hmm. exactly what Jose Mourinho said to you, because you say it was so outrageous, so beyond the pale, that you could barely believe it. So what I, I, was it? I, I couldn't, and that's why I've never repeated it. People accuse me of, oh, you're saving it for your book. I don't say it in the book. I won't say it at all. It's something that he knows. I hope, and what he's doing this season, which is good, is I think he's learned his lesson. I think he's looked at it and he says, I will not comment about referees. So if, if by well, me... Well, he learned his lesson, but quite frankly, he's one of the people who's forced you out of the game. By, by, no, he hasn't. And that's, that's, what, that's one thing you have to make very, very clear, and I make that clear in the book. I wouldn't let one single person or even a football club force me out you of the game. You said it was the most outrageous, the most hurtful thing you'd heard in 27 years yes, refereeing. It was. Yes, it was. You implied very clearly that it was a slur about your relationship with Alex Ferguson. Yep. So, in essence, he was saying you favoured Manchester United throughout your refereeing career. As far as he was concerned, you had been unfair to him. He, he certainly said I was, in essence, pandering to Sir Alex Ferguson. Um, and that's, that, that was where it went to. Um, with a lot of foul and abusive language chucked in. With, with, with some sexual innuendo thrown in. Sexual innuendo? Yes. But, I mean, that, that's just beyond belief. He was... It's, it's true and that's how, that's how life is. I can't... One, one of the problems you have with, with someone with such um, power and might, financial, it's very difficult for me to say, that's what he said, categorically prove that, because when you come to litigation, I can't say, I can't prove it. He said it to me very carefully, very cleverly, puts his head in and says what he says. This is a sick, a sick game you're talking about and describing to me. I, I love football. I love football, and what saddens me is that we have these situations that now come up. Now, what, by, by me highlighting that, which I've done uh, in the newspaper and in the book and on, and, and on a documentary, hopefully makes people look at it and say, that was beyond where we need to be.
And I hope, as I said to you, so far this season, we're only three or four games in, but Jose Mourinho has gone out and said, I will not speak about the referee. In fact, I won't even speak about the other manager's comments. The problem for you, Graham Paul, is that many people inside football believe that you brought many of these problems upon yourself because your style was always to be friendly to the players, yep. to be chatty, to make it a little bit unclear where the lines of authority began and ended. And you, in the end, reap the whirlwind from that. And that's partly why, for example, to take another I clear mean, case of Wayne Rooney, he swore in one game you refereed, the, the, the lip readers who followed it suggest, 27 times, often foul and abusive language directed at you. And you chose not to send him off. Okay, and then you complain about a lack covering, of discipline. Covering, covering your first point first, I would ask you to ask players whether they knew where they stood with Graham Pohl, the referee. Because I know that they did, and they liked me refereeing them, and that was never an issue. And when you read players' books, I get, I get nice mentions, not bad mentions, from top professional players. Well, you shouldn't so, be getting so nice they, mentions they, or they, bad they, mentions. The idea of a referee of is that, should. in the end, you're anonymous. As uh, Oliver Holt, the, ref you, the, the football writer, said of you at the end of your career, he said, the problem with you was that you didn't want to be anonymous. You wanted to be centre stage. Um, Oliver Holt can write what he likes. It's a personal thing with Oliver Holt. That's how he likes to write about. I mean, that's one of the issues. You've got, you've got people that write about football matches who are biased because they support football teams. They charge referees with being completely independent and they're not independent themselves. Bottom line, referees are professionals mm -hmm. and they get hammered when they make mistakes. And yep. you have been hammered because you've made mistakes and that surely is fair enough. Oh, I think I'm more than fair. I mean, we are account referees are accountable. Look at Rob Starr. We talked about this weekend. Straight away, his manager comes out and says, well, he won't be doing any games. This, this is weekend. the referee who now admits he made a terrible mistake on a penalty in the he Chelsea made, he made a, he game. He made a human error. He made a human error. How, how can, and we have to mention it, people associate you around the world with a particular World Cup game. Yep. Croatia, Australia. Yep. When you gave one Croatian player three yellow cards. You should have obviously sent him off after the second yellow card, but you forgot. You didn't do it. How can you, or Rob Stiles more recently, make mistakes like that? Uh, well, well, first of all, Rob Stiles didn't make that mistake. What you saw, what you saw well, there Rob was... Rob Stiles knows he made a mistake on the penalty. He arguably made another mistake with two yellow cards. But, but let's not get hung up on the detail. The, the question is, no, how the, can no, you no, make Stephen, such a basic no, mistake? Stephen, the detail is important because the detail explains how those mistakes are made. Well, let's stick with you. Let's what, leave what Rob happens, Stiles out of this. Okay, how did you, what, what how happens did you? in matches, okay, and, and, and you know, with, with, with respect, you know, you're not out there on the field to actually try and deal with some, some of the stuff that goes on out there. Okay? The pressure that you're under creates stress. That stress makes you react in an ir in a rational, in an in a illogical way. That's how it works. Now, most, no, it, it, most of the time, hang on, you've asked me a question. Because you're most of the time, very most well of the time, not to react in that Most way. of the time, you deal with that very, very well and get recognised for that by getting selected for World Cups, by getting selected for European Championships. That's, that's why you do it. But suddenly, at a, a crucial moment, it went wrong. I made a human error. Now, the difference is a player that makes a human error can make up for it, can, can not get blamed. You know, what happens, you, you watch England, Paul Robinson makes a mistake which, from which the team score, from which uh, Germany scored last night. What about Michael Owen, the other end, who misses what should have been a, a tap-in goal, puts it over the bar, he's not castigated, Paul Robinson is. If the referee makes a mistake, he's castigated, a player isn't. You, you, it's, it's not an even playing field. Well, nobody well, would d dispute that it's hard, but in the end... The very best don't make those sorts of mistakes. Correct, and as, as a result, I didn't referee the World Cup final. You said you were tearful when you realised what you'd done. How quickly did you realise what you'd done? That's what made it the most difficult thing that's ever happened, because if you give a penalty that you think, uh, as, as soon as you give you see something, gut instinct is it's a penalty. You give it, and you see from the player reaction, and you think, oh no, may, maybe it isn't. Maybe, maybe I've made a mistake. But then you convince yourself, no, I'm right. So you're not surprised when in the, in the dress room afterwards the assessor comes in and says, what were you doing with a penalty? You, you prepared yourself that that could, it's a possibility. The difficulty with Croatia Australia on the 22nd of June 2006, it's in there permanently, <laughs> is I had no idea. I had no idea that I'd cautioned that player twice. And when I sent him off at the end, I thought, fine, we've got him. Second yellow card, away he goes. My assistants, who were also watching the game very closely, were linked up to me by earpiece, didn't know either. The fourth official, who had a monitor in front of him, didn't know either, because he could have spoken to me and told me. The assessor at the match didn't know either. It was only 20 minutes later when a phone call came from FIFA to say, we have a problem here, 
he's cautioned someone twice and not and sent you, him off. And then you then we were told, fell apart, quite frankly. We, we'd, if you've worked 26 years to achieve something and you're very close to achieving it, if you're not disappointed at failing at that last moment by something that's, that's quite frankly, you know, a stupid error, a really stupid error, if I'd lost my rag and punched a player, then I'd think, well, fair enough. But to do that, of course you're going to fall apart. Of course you're going to be, I mean, disillusioned, still, disappointed, everything, of course. It still haunts you, doesn't it? Um, I wouldn't say haunts anymore. It's, it's permanently with me. I mean, I don't, I don't, I used to, I, it, for probably the next year, I woke up twice, three times a week thinking, why? Thinking, it hasn't happened. Thinking, I'm going to wake up and I'm still in Germany or I'm going to travel out there. Final thought. This fallibility that you're prepared to talk about now, that we've still seen this season in the right. Premier League with referees making fundamental mistakes, yep. it happens. Is that why there is now such a cry to move to better technology, to take some of the decision making and the authority away from referees and put it in the hands of machinery, whether it's on the goal line to declare whether a, a ball has crossed the line or whether it's on whether players fouling and diving? But, but technology is taking over. The reason, no, technology isn't taking over because it's not been introduced. People but it's are, going pe to. People are, no, people are trying to make technology take over. That's a different thing. The, 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 the fact, should, should the fact of the matter is, with, with, with factual decisions, with the ball over the line, football is about goals being scored. And a referee hates the fact that a goal scored and he can't detect it. That could be the speed of the ball, the angle he's at, whatever. So if technology can be introduced, and the point is people say, why don't we introduce it? It doesn't exist. Unbelievably, incredibly, given the money that's in the game, it hasn't been developed to the point where it's a fail-safe. Once it is, it should be introduced. But when you look at it and you say, oh, this game, you're losing control of it. Why are we looking? Why are we looking at the arm sallies of the game? Why are we saying, oh, referees have lost control? Ref Why not look at the players? Why not look at the managers and say to them, we charge you with your responsibility. You've got to get your act in order. You've got to be the guy that says, stop your antics. Stop abusing a referee. Stop crowding a referee. As soon as two or more players surround a referee, why not get that team and find them a maybe, decent sum of money? Maybe, Graham Paul, it's too late to do that, to grab the players and the managers by the scruff of the neck and tell them to change their behaviour because they're too powerful, they're too rich, and it's the referees who are easier to turn on. So let's kick the ref. Let's kick the ref. Is that, is that right? Is that fair? It's fair because we can't answer back. When I was refereeing, people say, oh, why, did, why don't you go in and demand to the FA? You know, you're the top referee. Because quietly on a committee, someone would go, X. Troublemaker. Troublemaker. Problem. Move him on. Graham Paul, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. A pleasure. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much indeed.